Hey everyone, welcome back to Heart Health with Michelle. I'm here today with Dr. Alone Giddig, and I'm so excited to give you this information that's so vital for you to take action and it be empowered in your heart health. Um, I'm going to have Dr. Giddig introduce himself, but I'm just so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for your time and, and our conversation. Thank you, Michelle. Um, it's great to be here. I've been following you on LinkedIn and uh, I've been a fan of your postings and try to use some of your insights from my own patients in my practice. So it's great to finally talk in person. Um, and I'm really, really excited to be able to try to get some of the messages that we're both passionate about uh, out to a wider audience. So I hope that you know this, this exercise we're gonna do today really allows us to reach people with the message that we both care deeply about. So uh, my name is Alan Giddig. I'm a non-invasive cardiologist. I work for Mount Sinai in Westchester County, New York, and I'm the director of cardiology for the Mount Sinai Doctors Westchester Practices. And uh, I also am the medical director for the Heart Failure Alliance for the network practices throughout the uh, greater New York area for Mount Sinai. I love it. Thank you so much for all that you do. I want to start off with our conversation just from a risk reduction standpoint. From both of our perspectives, we're trying to get more people to be empowered and take ownership of their of their heart health and really to take this on earlier. Um, let, I love, I know you kind of mentioned to me before about the, those studies showing that there's plaque formation in um, you know, younger and younger subsets of individuals. And I'd love for you to comment a little bit more about that before we dive into family family history and what we need to do to be more proactive in our heart health. Okay, great. Yeah, happy to. Um, advance warning, feel free to cut me off because this could easily be a 20 minute uh, answer to that question. There's just so much to say, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, basically, people come and ask me all the time, um, including, you know, I'm, I'm getting into that range where I can see 50 years old on my horizon. And, you know, my friends are starting to ask me this question more and more. Who should go to a cardiologist? You know, who should get tested for, you know, heart risk? Um, and the longer I'm at this work uh, and the more I learn, the more I realize the answer is really almost anybody, almost every adult, because the fact of the matter is that we now know the process that leads to disease of arteries, whether it's the arteries in your heart or in your brain or your carotid artery or your aorta, that disease process is very similar in all those locations. And it is a gradual process that starts with cholesterol carrying particles. I won't get into names and, and acronyms and everything at the moment. They get out of the bloodstream and into the artery wall. And we have found out that that happens way earlier in life than we realized. Um, on average, the study suggests it probably takes 30 to 40 years of that process gradually occurring before somebody ends up having chest pain, needing a stent, or having a stroke. Um, studies now have shown that young people who unfortunately die in car accidents or soldiers on the battlefield who are healthy in every other way, when they do autopsies, they find at least the very early stages, very, very preliminary stages of plaque starting to occur uh, at very young ages. And we see this even in children less than 10 years old, increasing gradually into the teens. And by the age of 40, the majority of people have at least these very early lesions. Um, more recently, we've had studies done using imaging, ultrasound imaging and CAT scan imaging to look at arteries of people who are in their 40s and 50s healthy, walking around, no known serious illness. Um, and keep in mind, you need more plaque to be able to see it on these imaging studies. The imaging can't pick up these very early stages that I mentioned in the autopsy studies. But when they do imaging, they find that about 60% of people already have plaque in at least one artery. So it's so common. It's the number one cause of death in the US and in most industrialized societies. Um, and the risk factors that lead to it are so ubiquitous in our society that it's really, really important to get checked out. Now, if you have a family history of heart disease, you can never start too soon. Because um, if your goal, which I presume most of your listeners will feel this is their goal, if your goal is to say, I wanna be 90 years old and run around after my grandchildren 
and have no disease of the arteries of my legs or my heart or my brain. Um, to keep your body and your arteries in that kind of pristine shape over the course of a 90 year life, you really have to start early and prevent that 30 to 40 year buildup from occurring. So let's talk about, well, how do we, and what's the right time to intervene? So you mentioned the, the CT scan, your coronary artery scan to assess for plaque formation. What would be your general recommendation for who should be getting that test? Right. And do all cardiologists provide it? So another question that can have a very long answer, but you know, we can step back for a second before we get into those details. So the ideal thing would be, we have a test, it's been studied and proven to be effective and it's reimbursed by insurance or it's very cheap to pay for out of pocket. It has no side effects. Um, and we can start doing it at a very young age. Let's say in every patient who's 15, 20, 30 years old. And we know the certain value when that test reaches a certain test result, a, a cutoff value where now we know if you don't intervene now, you're going to have disease in 30 years. Then that would be easy. We do that on everyone every year. And when they get to that value, we intervene. That test doesn't exist, I'm sad to say. And um, it's a huge area of research all the time to find these types of tests. I doubt we're ever going to have a test that's that good at predicting. What we have now, and there will be refinements, and you know, this conversation may look different in five or seven years, well, we have our tests that clearly change the prognosis. They clearly change the chances that you're going to develop disease in 10 years and vastly change the likelihood in 20 or 30 years. But it's still a guesstimate. It still says if we looked at 100 or 1,000 people like you with this result, X percent will develop disease. So you're never going to know for sure what your destiny is. Um, therefore, if you want to make sure you do everything possible to have that um, optimal life expectancy and full health throughout your life, the, the current state of things is that if you know you have major risk, and I would say, especially if any test shows you have stum plaque in some arteries, you get on top of it now. Because once you know your arteries no longer look on the imaging test like the child's arteries did, something has started and we can't ever tell you the exact time window where it's crunch time. So you get started early. And if you do that, there's a lot of research that suggests you're likely to not just delay, but actually avoid disease. It is not a, a destiny that can't be avoided. And it's very, very important for people to understand that. And I think that's really important because a lot of times when people come to me after they have a high coronary artery calcium score and they're like, I'm scared I'm going to have a heart attack tomorrow. Does this mean I'm going to die tomorrow? And it's more of, no, you have this information. So you use it as an empowerment tool to be extra proactive in optimizing your blood vessel health and making sure that it, it is in the best state it can be to stabilize the plaque that's there and to prevent future promotion of more plaque. I think it's before we go into the details of kind of the things that might drive that I like to mention one point that you did say, you know, if you know you have a family history of, of, you know, premature heart attacks or heart disease in your family, at that point, you want to be proactive. Is there a different type? Uh, would you say that individuals who do have a family history, and let's say they have a little elevated LDL for several years, is that a good way? Is that a good time to say, you know what, let me get a coronary artery calcium scan? Yeah. Should they be a little bit more proactive? Right. So um, I didn't actually get to what's an important point for your listeners, which you asked about, which is um, who should get these tests and what tests exist and how do you get them? So first, um, let, let me try to get to all of that, as well as what you just spoke about with the family history. Before I do, I would be remiss if I didn't say this. A lot of the patients who feel like, oh, I have plaque, I'm destined to have a heart attack, feel that way because their father and you know, almost all of their father's siblings had heart attacks. So the fact is that um, if you have a genetic predisposition to heart disease, it is absolutely not the case that that means that's going to drive what happens to you. It increases your risk, but we have very good evidence now that living healthily, optimizing your risk factors, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, body weight, blood glucose metabolism, et cetera, uh, inflammation in the body 
exercising, eating a healthy diet, all of those things definitely affect uh, risk, including in people with strong genetic predisposition. We know that now. And so there's a whole field of epigenetics about how all these things can change how the genes that are programmed in a certain way actually manifest themselves. Um, there is no question about that. Um, so if somebody has a family history, the ideal thing there would be to be able to know what genes are uh, involved and test the person. We don't have that yet. That may very well come in our lifetime. There is a huge boom in the field of genetics now that the technology has advanced so much. Um, there's something called polygenic risk scores, which are really going to be a game changer in my opinion. They're not quite ready for prime time where they basically integrate into one score all of the genetic mutation variants that are known to, based on other previous work, they're known to increase your risk by X amount or Y amount. And then they weight the results based on what the impact on risk is. They come up with one number and say, you've got, the, let me back up. We're pretty sure that it's very rare that you have one gene. There are a couple of situations where one gene influences risk. It's usually a lot of changes in genes that each have smaller effects, which all add up. So they do this combined risk score. That will be very helpful, but we don't have that readily available. So how do we image arteries to understand plaque? Um, Sorry, don't want to cut you off. And I know this is so important. I love where this is going, but I have a question. I want you to cut me off. So tell me about lipoprotein A okay. and should we be testing for it? Before I tell you about lipoprotein A, we have to talk about um, the alphabet soup that I didn't want to get into before. So cholesterol. Um, if your cholesterol is high, do you need a calcium scan? You asked me that. Well, the fact of the matter is that all the things we talk about that predict risk, um, you can get lost in a lot of misinformation online, uh, a lot of which is actually totally well-intentioned. There are statistical and methodological reasons why you can look at one research study that clearly shows cholesterol um, increases risk of heart disease and another that clearly seems to show it doesn't. Um, and usually, if you understand the methodology and how to read those parts of the papers and pick them apart, you will understand that it was an honest attempt at research, but it's not negating the fact that cholesterol is an issue. It's showing that over a certain time frame, which often is too short a time to see a process that takes 30 years or more, um, or looking at it in a certain way, you don't see that effect. The fact remains that there is overwhelming evidence now that the level of your cholesterol in your bloodstream is the, one of the most, if not the most uh, strong predictor of any lab test you can have of your future risk. Now, that being said, you're still going to have lots of exceptions to the rule. This process of artery disease is very complicated. It's not at all a one-to-one -one relationship. I have cholesterol in my bloodstream. It will get into my artery walls. Lots of other things have to happen to make that happen but it is a very powerful predictor. And the research is now pretty much overwhelming that the duration of time matters. And if you've had that for since childhood because of genetics or since you know, your middle age and it's now 30 years, you're at a much higher risk than if it just developed recently. So lipoproteins are the substances in our bloodstream carrying cholesterol. You can think of them as a particle. Each lipoprotein is simply a cluster of hundreds of cholesterol molecules, okay? The liver makes cholesterol, so do all the other cells in your body, but the liver makes more of it and it puts them into these lipoproteins. Each cholesterol looks the same. It has a similar, it has one chemical structure. And when you take hundreds of them and you cluster them like a cluster of grapes and you tie them up with a protein, that is an LDL particle, an LDL lipoprotein particle those get secreted into your bloodstream, okay? I'm oversimplifying because there's intermediate forms, but let's just say, and the fact of the matter is that the LDL particles floating in your bloodstream are what really determines the risk in 99% of people. So you don't have a molecule of cholesterol floating along in your blood. You have hundreds of them clustered into an LDL particle and tons of LDL particles constantly in your bloodstream. If somebody develops disease of their arteries, it is because an LDL particle escaped from the inside of the blood vessel and migrated into the artery wall and got stuck there. And once it's stuck there, it gets chemically modified, oxidation, inflammation occurs around it, and you get plaque, okay? 
So you asked about lipoprotein little a. I told you that you get a cluster of cholesterol molecules and a protein tied around it. That's a traditional LDL particle. If in some people they have a genetic mutation that causes their livers to also produce a large amount of a different protein, not the usual protein that gets tied around all LDL particles, but an additional one that carries the, the name little a with it, it's apolipoprotein little a, that then gets stuck to the other protein. Okay, so your typical LDL cluster of cholesterol, the protein is called apolipoprotein B. You then get this abnormal protein called apolipoprotein lowercase a stuck to that. You now have a dysfunctional LDL particle that carries higher risk of causing atherosclerosis. Those particles for uh, a number of reasons that are only now becoming um, clearer, but not definitively understood, makes it more likely to get into artery walls and cause plaque there. So lipoprotein little a, you asked about it because um, you're right, that is one of the cases where there is one genetic thing that matters tremendously in risk. Um, but it's the exception because the vast majority of genetically mediated cardiovascular risk seems to be probably from lots of smaller, uh, lower magnitude mutations that add up. Does that explain what that lipoprotein little a is? Yeah. So, so do you recommend that people get it if someone doesn't know their family history? And because mm -hmm. we don't have all of that polygenic score just yet, is it something that people should look into or could it give you a false sense of hope or can it, is it a little piece of the puzzle we should, we should care about? Definitely a little piece of the puzzle. Um, and such a small piece uh, in, in, when it's normal, there are plenty of people who have a disease, even early onset disease, whose lipoprotein little a is normal. So by no means should you have false hope based on it. I, I, I tech check it in every single person that it comes to see me for purposes of prevention. Um, it is genetically mediated. It's estimated that 80% of the values over time are going to be stable based on genetics. So it doesn't change much. So you check it once, there's no real reason to check it again. Um, but we used to think it was more rare than, than it is, in part because we only checked it in people who had strong family histories to see, is that a family that has this as the genetic basis? Um, I definitely would say if you have a family history, you should be checking lipoprotein little a once. Um, we now know that if you check it in all comers, we see it in approximately 15 to 20% of people. You know, it's not at all rare. So yes, I think everyone should have it checked once. Now, if it's elevated, there's elevated and there's really elevated. The risk clearly is related to how high it is. Um, and there are people who have quite high levels and it doesn't seem to cause disease. And we are clueless at the moment about how to differentiate who that is and who that isn't. Um, other than to do imaging of plaque, which we haven't yet talked about, um, to try to see where somebody's arteries are at the moment. But yes, I think that's a test everyone should have done once. Awesome. So, so let's talk a little bit about the, the calcium artery, the calcium score, the coronary artery calcium score a little bit. And then I'm going to pause our great conversation and I'm going to put it in our part two with insulin resistance and inflammation. Cause I know that's one topic we're both very passionate about. Um, but I want to make sure that we're, we're staying to our time as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. So coronary calcium score is a test that is readily available that gives you information about um, the plaque status in your coronary arteries. It's not the only test that can do that. Um, you know, there are lots of tests that get done for lots of reasons that can give you hints to this. So for instance, if you had a chest X-ray done uh, or even dental X-rays, okay? Usually when there's plaque, let me back up, plaque forms its cholesterol. Remember I told you it, it has to have an LDL particle get out of the bloodstream and carry those, that bunch of cholesterol molecules into the artery wall. So initially plaque is cholesterol. When it's been there for some time, components of it start to calcify, which is actually probably a good thing. It's probably a benign process. It's certainly protective because when the cholesterol starts to be all um, basically smothered with calcium, it avoids the possibility that that cholesterol will cause a sudden clotting event. I won't get into the 
the, the pathophysiology of that, but to have a sudden acute vessel close off from a heart attack or stroke requires a large amount of cholesterol that is exposed from the plaque into the bloodstream. So the more calcified it is, the, the lower that chance. Um, but if you have an x-ray done and they see calcification in the wall of your aorta, let's say on a chest x-ray or in your carotid artery on an x-ray done of the teeth, um, you know you have some plaque and you're in that early stage now where you can intervene. Um, if you have ultrasound studies done of the carotid arteries, the aorta in your belly, the legs, um, you can see plaque. Now, as opposed to a calcium scan test, those other studies are not as far along in the research to show number one, how much and in whom they increase risk prediction over standard risk factor assessment. Number two, um, because of that, they haven't been incorporated into guidelines clearly, although some, the ultrasounds are starting to make their way into the European cardiology guidelines on cholesterol lowering. Uh, and number three, they're not as readily available. They're still typically done in places that are looking for evidence of symptomatic disease. People have abnormal physical exam or symptoms, not for prevention. And so usually you're gonna pay out of pocket and the costs tend to be higher than with a calcium scan. But I'm bringing them up because they're going to be very important in the future. They have no radiation involved as opposed to a calcium scan. Um, and some studies are showing that atherosclerosis in those locations detected on ultrasound is actually quite a bit more, more common in younger age people, I mean, 40s and 50s, than the calcium scan. So you can easily have a calcium score of zero and have atherosclerosis somewhere else. So those tests are coming. Um, the calcium scan test has been around for a long time and is very well validated in terms of its use. It is a very, very, very low dose CAT scan, okay? Um, because you don't need good quality, uh, intricate detail pictures to see calcium anywhere on a, in the body because it's such a bright white signal on an X-ray. So if they do this very low dose CAT scan and they see calcium anywhere along your coronary arteries, it means there's plaque there. Plaque has been there and it's been there long enough to calcify. And there is a very simple way of quantifying the signal of the brightness of calcium on the scan and how many places have it to give you a calcium score. And that number, both the absolute number and the percentile, how it compares to other people your age, has been well validated in many, many studies that it predicts risk better than just your age, your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so forth. Um, it's so little radiation that I would say the risk of having um, any ill effects of radiation, which principally would be cancer in your lifetime is really negligibly affected by that test done one time. Um, we don't do it every year for 20 years, but um, it's a very, really, really, really negligible risk. Um, so how do you get it done? Well, it has to be done in a place that has a CAT scan, which is not usually most doctor's offices. And doctors tend to order what they know. They order a lot of tests that they're familiar with, that they read themselves, that they see done in their office. This test requires referring out to another place, getting referral, you know, getting authorization, et cetera. It tends to not be on people's radar screen enough. That's changing more and more because the guidelines have actually recommended this test being useful in many patients who are trying to make decisions about cholesterol lowering treatment, aspirin, et cetera, other types of medications. Um, you can basically ask any cardiologist to order it for you and you should have no problem getting it done. Many primary care doctors will as well, um, but some will say, I'm not familiar with the test or how to interpret it. So you have to get it from a cardiologist, but you should ask for it. So who should Great. get it? That's gonna be your next question, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so in order to give us enough time for inflammation and insulin resistance, I will basically say this, um, we know based on the research that over the age of 40, this test carries significant, um, prognostic information. Those studies have looked at risk over the next three to five years. So at very high scores within three to five years, it clearly increases risk at a score of zero. You're close, to essentially zero, almost zero risk in that time frame. Um, we know the disease takes longer to develop and it's definitely gonna be relevant for risk for the 20 to 30 year outlook. Given how low the radiation exposure is, it's not unreasonable to do the test in a person who's under 40 years old, especially when there's a family history, if they 
want to know where they stand and it's going to change management. So everybody will be better off at a lower weight, exercising more with lower cholesterol. But if there's questions about medications or the person needs motivation, this test is very useful. And it's been shown that it will affect doctors' prescribing habits and patients' compliance with, with recommendations, lifestyle or medications. So, so it's a very reasonable test to get even in middle age to know where you stand. Right. So, so this is the million dollar question. And I don't know if you really have an answer or it might be a little political, but if heart disease is the number one killer globally, and we know that we can prevent it or 80 to 90% is preventable through science-based nutrition, lifestyle med intervention, medicine as needed. Why isn't a coronary calcium scan given at almost like per preventative in the sense of a mammography or a colonoscopy. Why are we, why is it so not unheard of by so many individuals and why isn't it such a routine exam if, you know, it, it, if heart disease takes a lot more lives than cancer does? No, it's a great question. I definitely don't have the answer or answers for it. Um, it would be conjecture. Um, but I think that some of it has to do with um, not as much political, but, um, you know, just the timing of when these things grow up in, in the history of, 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 of preventive guidelines coming into be. Um, calcium scan test was later than mammography and in an era where we were very cost conscious as a society, right? For good reason. I mean, you know, the U.S. Co healthcare costs are unfathomably high and um, a huge part of, of the total budget of expenditure in this country. Um, and so any test that's going to add something to that is scrutinized in a different way. And the people who write the guidelines are experts that sit and review the evidence and then also let their personal you know, opinions factor into what they vote on. And the concerns, I think, are that they understand if they recommend this test should be done in everyone or everyone over a certain age, then most doctors, almost all doctors, will just do it all the time and might do it every year or every two years. Um, and the costs get really, really high. So I think that's a big part of the reason. Um, there are probably some other reasons as well why people don't hear about it as much. Um, and some of that may have to do with, you know, if a cardiologist, and this is, you know, the... The, the, the unpleasant underbelly of medicine, but doctors are human too. And they sometimes are influenced by what tests are easy to order. They're readily available and that make them money. You know, if a doctor has two choices, well, I can do an ultrasound of your carotid arteries or put you on a treadmill, or I can send you for the calcium scan test, which has, you know, more uh, potent risk prediction, but one I can just do order quickly in my office and I'll get paid for it. And the other, I have to send you to another place, go through insurance steps with faxing referrals and they get paid. Over time, that probably creeps into some discussion about the test with patients. And that might be why people don't hear about it as much. Of course, that's a sweeping generalization and all doctors are different. But the fact of what I'm trying to say is people listening to this podcast should not say, oh, you know, I've never heard of this test, so it must not be important. It's very important. It's clearly in every uh, major guideline um, and you should do your due diligence and learn about it and ask for it. If you have risk factors and you're trying to decide how to treat them, uh, ask, at least ask about it. You know, ask your doctor if they don't think it's appropriate, why? Make sure that it makes sense. Maybe they'll tell you you have to treat yourself no matter what, but it should be discussed and asked for. Love it. Um, I know we want to get to the part two, but one quick question, because you just mentioned something that I know comes up a lot in my prior practice, and I want to make sure I think the audience will have it too. So difference between stress tests and CACs and coronary calcium scan, what does the stress test not tell us that the coronary calcium scan does? Right. So um, a stress test does have good information in the sense that it tells us about somebody's cardio, cardiac fitness level, aerobic capacity, you know, um, cardiovascular fitness. Um, and that has a lot of um, strong prognostic information over a lifespan in terms of longevity and chronic disease and so forth. Um, but for the most part, what a stress test is telling you is, um, does somebody have impaired blood flow to their heart muscle? Do they have an artery that has uh, developed enough plaque at one location or multiple single locations um, where it's encroaching on the inside of the blood vessel by 70, 80, 90% and impairing blood flow. And if that's the case, 
then you know that that probably is why someone's having shortness of breath for, so, for instance, not their asthma. Um, and having a narrowing like that definitely changes your risk of heart attack. But not having a narrowing like that doesn't tell you anything about where your arteries are on that spectrum of, of developing plaque. Um, you can have a normal stress test and be the person whose arteries are like they were when they were 18, or you can have a normal stress test and be a person who has 50 to 60% uh, obstruction based on heaped up plaque in a dozen locations. And there's tons of, of cholesterol rich plaques there that are a risk for a heart attack. You don't know that unless you do a test that looks to image vessel walls and see plaque. And so the calcium scan test is the most accessible um, and lowest priced option at the moment to do that um, and has the research in the largest number of people at the moment. Love it. Thank you so much for that clarification. I think that's great. Um, I love all this information, such great tidbits. Um, thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it, Dr. Gittig. I'm going to pause this recording and I'm gonna, well, I want everyone to come and see us in the second part, but we'll talk a little bit more of what we can do um, to help with prevention of heart disease. Thanks great. so much for being here. Thank you, pleasure.